Thank you so much for joining me. Um, in this segment, I'm going to be introducing how we write chemical reactions and how we um, balance chemical reactions so we don't ever give the appearance that we have created or destroyed matter. Um, chemistry is very abstract. We may see something turn blue, um, but we don't really see what's going on at the atomic and molecular level. And so we need symbols to give meaning to what we're seeing. And that's what balancing chemical reactions is about. Um, now, um, when we're doing a chemical reaction, uh, we're distinguishing it from a physical change because in a chemical change or a chemical reaction, we have what we term intramolecular, that is within a mo molecule, mean molecular, sorry, within a molecule, forces of attraction are being broken and or formed. So it takes energy to break, you free energy when you form. And when that happens, we get a new substance and that new substance has its own new physical and chemical properties. So structure determines function. So if we change the structure, we're going to change how it functions. Now, um, note that in tra-molecular, we need to be careful to distinguish that from what happens in a physical change, such as melting or boiling or freezing or condensing. In that case, intermolecular forces are broken um, and, or or, and or formed, honestly. So we should put broken or formed. So forces are broken and or formed. Okay, there are some, however, I mean, there are a lot of things that are pretty easy to distinguish. You know, if I burn methane, like from a Bunsen burner, and I get um, tremendous amount of heat released, uh, I can readily identify that as a chemical change. If I boil water, I haven't broken bonds. I still have H2O. I haven't decomposed it to hydrogen and oxygen gas because that would blow up. Um, so I, I haven't broken any bonds there. But there are a few that are a little more challenging, a little bit more ambiguous in how we define it. And a key one is the dissolving of a salt. Um, a dissolving of a salt is typically or often considered a physical change. Um, and the reason we would call it a physical change is because we can readily get that salt back by something as simple as evaporation. And so that's typically why people want to classify it as a physical change. But salts have ionic bonds, attractions between positive cations and negative anions. And these an ionic bonds are broken. And then attractions um, between ion and the water are formed. And heat is often involved. Often heat is released. There's a few cases in which heat is absorbed, but when heat changes occur, that's evidence of a chemical change. And um, so dissolving a salts can kind of fall into both classes of those. Now, honors, I think that it's important for you to understand this. AP, that's an objective for you. And IB, I think that's just a really important nuance, you know, especially when you talk about theory of knowledge and what we know and how we classify knowledge. Okay, so how do we know a chemical uh, reaction has occurred? Well, for one, we're going to see, we need some sort of evidence, something we can see or experience in the lab. And one is the formation of a gas, and we're clearly not boiling a substance. Okay, we can't boil water and say we're seeing evidence of a chemical change. This would be something we've mixed two things at room temperature, well below boiling points, and a gas evolves. And that's what you might see when you add vinegar to baking soda, which is what we do for lab safety. If we add baking soda to an acid, it bubbles because it's forming CO2. Um, sometimes we may not be able to visualize those bubbles, but we see an apparent change in mass as we go from reactants to products. Now, mass can't be created nor destroyed. So if there's an apparent change in mass, it's because that mass was lost likely as a gas. 
Another is an important word, and that's the formation of a precipitate. Now, a precipitate is a solid, but not all solids are precipitates. It's a solid that forms when aqueous solutions are added. So when um, mixing aqueous solutions. Aqueous means dissolved in water. So when we're mixing aqueous solutions, if a solid forms, that's called a precipitate. But not all solids are precipitates. So be careful with that. All right. Um, the next one is heat or energy in some form. Um, the you know fire from a Bunsen burner or sometimes a light is emitted. So that's evidence of energy is absorbed or released. And that's evidence of a um, chemical change. So if you're holding on to a test tube, if that test tube gets hot, heat's been released. If that test tube gets cold, that means heat's being absorbed from your hand and the test tube. Um, and then finally, we get a color change. A color change happens because we change structure. Change structure, you change function. And you may change the colors of light that are absorbed and hence the colors that are reflected and that we see. Okay, so remember I said we use symbols for meaning. And so if we have a solid, whether it's crystals or a precipitate or a powder, um, we're going to use parentheses S, parentheses G for gases, parentheses L for pure liquids, water is typically going to be a pure liquid, for example. Aqueous means dissolved in water. Dissolved in water. By definition, acids. We'll talk a lot about acids. You know what they are generally. Acids are aqueous. Okay? So those are some of the symbols that we're going to do use to confirm meaning. And well, how do you know what the symbols are? That can get challenging. Oops, hold on a sec. There's another symbol we need, two symbols we need. Um, we have an arrow here. That means to yield or produce. If it's a single arrow, it goes effectively 100%, okay? To the best of our ability to measure, it's 100%. You may see double arrows. And that means it proceeds less than 100% and that these reactions are reversible. That's why I don't like to use reversibility as a test for a chemical or physical change because some physical changes aren't reversible, like ripping up paper, um, and some chemical changes are reversible. So we want to not use that as our test for chemical versus physical. Okay, how do we know their states? Well, metals are solids, with one exception. Mercury is a liquid at room temperature. For the non-metals, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, those are all gases, along with, of course, our noble or inert gases. Bromine's a liquid. Everything else is a solid. Okay, so if you go, go down um, the group from fluorine, it goes... Um, gas, gas, liquid, solid. Okay. If it's an ionic compound and it's not dissolved in water, like table salt, sometimes if you think of an example it can help you, those are solids. Okay. If it is does dissolve in water, we're going to use solubility rules to determine that. And we'll talk about that in another video clip. Um, sometimes you will be required to memorize these and sometimes not. Okay, but if it is soluble in water, we would now put aqueous beside it. So if you put sodium chloride in your water to make spaghetti, you now have aqueous sodium chloride. All right, when we write reactions, we have to make sure we don't violate the law of conservation of mass. In a follow-up video, I'll talk about balancing equations um, in a little bit more detail. Um, but we want to make sure that we have the same number of ions um, and elements on both sides of the um, yields arrow. All right, there's quite a few different ways we can represent reactions. We can represent reactions 
as molecular, and that pretty much just says the elements that are present. So ethene is C2H4, okay, and uh, it should say ethene gas reacts with oxygen. Oxygen is a gas to form, that's what the arrow is, carbon dioxide, and that's a gas, and water. Sometimes you'll see water listed as a liquid here, and sometimes you'll see it as water vapor. And um, I would accept either, um, but there's a lot of heat given off, right? So you could actually put plus heat here. And when we write these, we have to make sure we have the same of both elements. Just to start, I have two carbons on this side, so I'm going to put a two in front there to get two carbons. I have four hydrogens. Two are in the formula. When you balance, you only change coefficients in the front. Okay, And now I have four plus two oxygens on this side. And so I need to put a three here. And you'll see a lot more practice of that. It's a little bit trial and error. Um, but that's how we would write it as a molecular equation, just as the molecular formula showing up. Very streamlined, but doesn't tell us how these are bonded together. To see how they're bonded together, we would want a structural formula. And so this would be attempting to show that between those two carbons, I have a double bond, and then single bonds with the hydrogens. And I have three oxygens, and there's a double bond. So this is a better way to show a, a little bit of a glimpse into three-dimensional nature of these molecules. Not completely three-dimensional, but um, certainly more information than what we had before. Okay, and then water is HOH. Okay, now what's really popular now uh, lately to make sure students understand at the molecular level is to draw particle diagrams. So a particle diagram would just envision circles or, or maybe another shape. So bigger circles for the carbons and the hydrogens. And um, sometimes what they'll have for another molecule is they'll shade it. So that would be my oxygens. And let me just go ahead and, and make my hydrogens a little orange there so you can tell the difference. And that way you can actually count the particles that you have. And I want three of those, but you notice it's not telling us much about bonding. And then I have two, and then I have, whoops, I didn't mean to put an oxygen there. So then I have um, two oxygens with a carbon. So oxygen and an oxygen. I'm going to go ahead and make that oxygen there. And then the carbon was just the singular one, and then hydrogen. So you see, this is a little cumbersome, but it's very common to see these on um, homework and a lot of college level textbooks um, especially. Okay, so that would be something of a particle diagram. So this gives you an introduction to how we're going to be trying to provide meaning to very abstract things that we can't see with the naked eye. So hopefully this will help and you will join me in our next video where I will balance some more chemical reactions. Until then, thanks for joining me.